welcome to Mutual Information. My name is DJ. In this video, I'm going to explain the glorious exponential family. It's a generalization of virtually every distribution you've seen. The normal, the beta, the gamma, the exponential, the Bernoulli, the binomial, the multinomial, the multinomial, the negative binomial, the Wishart, the geometric, the chi-squared. These and others are all members of this extremely cool team of distributions. But it's more than a generalization. From this perspective, special properties are revealed which ease maximum likelihood estimation, simplify Bayesian statistics, and enable generalized linear models, among other things. And in fact, we'll see that everything looks simpler within this broader context. Part one, which is this video, will focus on the generality of the exponential family. I'll show how many of the distributions you've seen are the result of making certain choices for the settings of this generalized device. If I do my job, you should get a sense of the family's breadth. Part two will focus on its properties, which will reveal why the exponential family is used so frequently and hopefully motivate you to use it as well. Sound good? Okay, let's begin. To start, we begin in a familiar circumstance, fitting a distribution to data. The first step is to just guess a distribution. In this case, I'd say the normal is a reasonable choice. Wait, in drawing that line, I've skipped over a crucial step. After we made the decision to use the normal, how do we actually select the parameters that fit this data best? After all, there are a lot of different parameters to choose from. Well, as you may already know, a very common approach is to pick the parameters that maximize the likelihood of this data. In the case of the normal, those parameters are the mean, called mu, and the standard deviation, called sigma. So that means we search for values, mu star and sigma star, that maximize the likelihood of our data. Nothing too crazy there, but we'll get crazy. We're going to do the exact same thing, but first we'll rewrite the likelihood function of the normal like this. Let me explain. What we're doing here is separating expressions involving only parameters from expressions involving only observed values of x. Specifically, all parameters that aren't multiplied with observed x values are moved out of the exponent into this denominator. For what remains in the exponent, we structure it as a dot product of two vectors. One vector of the dot product depends only on the x values. Notice, there are no parameters. The other vector depends only on the parameters. Later, we'll see that this structure is super important. To emphasize, we're separating parameters from observations and we're casting their interaction as a dot product. Next, to simplify things, let's relabel with new parameters theta1 and theta2. I suspect you would agree that if we knew the values of theta1 and 2, we could figure out mu and sigma. So, speaking in terms of theta 1 and 2 is just another way to specify the normal. In fact, since knowing theta 1 and 2 gives us mu and sigma, then we could say the denominator is just a function of those two. So, let's call it z of theta 1 and 2. Okay, now, in much the same way we found the maximum likelihood values for mu and sigma, we could find the maximum likelihood values for theta 1 and 2. So, we would search this space until we found our best fit. At this point, I should point out why rewriting things this way is interesting. It's because nearly every distribution you've seen can be reworked into this form. So from this perspective, we can find the best fit parameters, but for a huge range of distributions. That said, let's write out that form explicitly in all its generalized glory. Ready? Okay. If the probability or density of a vector x given a parameter vector theta can be written in this form, then it's within the exponential family. Okay, there's a lot going on here. So I'll break down the components of this equation. But before I do so, I'd like to make an observation. That is, the inputs to this equation are two vectors. That itself is a generalization. In the case of the normal, x is a scalar, which is a specific case of a length one vector. Also for the normal, the parameters take the form of the length two vector, as we saw. A lot of distributions have this form, where x is a scalar, but not all. And that's important. For example, the multivariate normal has x as a vector, and therefore the exponential family can include the multivariate normal. That's major and important flexibility. Okay, with that said, let's walk through these components. First, let's talk about h of x. This is a function which maps from our x vector to a non-negative number, and it provides one factor in our probability. The important thing to notice here is it does not depend on the parameters. Therefore, it has the ability to make some x's more likely than others, regardless of the parameters. Intuitively, you should think of this as the intrinsic 
probabilistic volume of x. If that sounds abstract, don't worry. Later, we'll see an example to make this idea concrete. And one more thing. A frequent choice of h of x is to map all values of x to 1. So often, it has no effect. Moving on, let's consider t of x. t is in bold, which means the output is a vector. So t of x is a vector-to-vector -vector function. OK, but what does it mean? Well, we call this the sufficient statistics. Pretend for a second that h of x is 1. In that case, t of x would measure everything within x that makes a difference in determining the probability. In other words, if you change x in a way that doesn't change the sufficient statistics, then you won't change the probability. That is, t of x is sufficient in determining the probability of x. OK, but what about when h of x isn't 1? Well, in that case, you might say that t of x is sufficient in the ways the parameters care about. Next, let's consider how the sufficient statistics impact the probability. First, we recognize that we'll take the dot product of t of x with theta, meaning we'll multiply each element of t of x with each of theta and sum those up, giving us a single number. Now, the dot product can yield a number anywhere on the number line, positive or negative, but it works its way into the probability through the exponential function. If you're familiar with exponentials, you know that raising e to any real number always yields a positive number. So this term must be positive, which is another defining and simplifying feature of the exponential family. OK, deep breath. We're halfway there. Let's now discuss z of theta. This is called the normalizer, and it has one purpose, to ensure that the probabilities sum to 1 if you integrate over the domain of x. So naturally, it's defined as this integral. I think it's pretty clear that if we were to find z of theta this way, integrating p of x given theta will yield a value of 1. One thing to notice is that since we are integrating out x, this expression depends only on theta. That's another characteristic of the normalizer. It speaks to the domain of x, so it has nothing to do with the individual value of x. And that, in fact, is a big task. That domain can be massive, exponentially massive. So this integration can be a real challenge, sometimes impossible. Keep that in mind. One other thing. It's quite easy to imagine that for some choices of h of x and t of x, there could be parameter values for which this integration is infinite. Well, for that, we simply rule out those parameters. We only consider parameters where the normalizer is finite. Sometimes it's best to just throw things away. And one last thing. You may have noticed this one weird term. Well, it is indeed weird, weird enough to get its own bullet. The term refers to the measure of x. In general, it can provide the volume of x, just like h of x does. But we can dedicate that task entirely to h of x without losing anything. What remains of nu of dx is to generalize to both the continuous and discrete domains. To simplify, to know nu of dx means you know how to sum over the space of x, which will be either taking the integral over a continuous function or summing over discrete events. All right, so that was a head full. Let's take a step back. The exponential family is a generalization in which a lot of distributions live. That means if we make choices for h of x and t of x, and we know how to sum over the domain of x, then we'll get a specific distribution, probably one that we've seen before. In fact, let's go over the choices made to get to the normal. In that case, h of x maps to 1, so all values of x have the same intrinsic volume. The sufficient statistics of the scalar value x maps to a length 2 vector with elements x and x squared. Finally, integration involves summing over the real line. From that, everything else falls from the definition of the exponential family. But recreating the normal distribution isn't the interesting part. It's that we have these degrees of freedom over h of x, t of x, and the discrete or continuous space. So let's explore some different choices. Let's say we were faced with this binary data, which we will assume is independent and identically distributed, and we want to determine a distribution from the exponential family to model this. Well. We'll start by making those choices. First, what is h of x? Well, there are only two outcomes, 0 or 1, and they're merely labels of two categories. So I see no good reason to assign a higher likelihood to one over the other, regardless of the parameters. So let's set h of x to 1. OK, but what about t of x? A good question to ask here is, what should we know about an observation that provides everything we need, everything that is sufficient, for determining the probability of x given the parameters? Well, there's only one thing to know, whether it's 0 or 1. So let's just return that value in a length 1 vector. Lastly, how do we sum over these events? Well, 
There are only two, so we'll just sum over those. With that, we've made all our choices. That's going to force our normalizer to be something. Specifically, in this case, it'll be e raised to theta plus one. If you're curious why, pause the video on this. And here's the punchline. If we plug these into the expression of the exponential family, we'll see that it gives the Bernoulli distribution. In other words, fitting this thing is the same thing as fitting a Bernoulli. This is because the exponential family would provide a constant probability determined by theta for each of the two outcomes. Those probabilities are given with these expressions. Pretty cool, right? Within this framework, simple choices have yielded familiar distributions. But maybe it's too simple, too easy. Okay, let's push it. Let's do something harder. Let's say we came across this data. In this case, each row shows an observation of x, which is now a length three vector. Each number is a non-negative integer, and we see each vector sums to 10, which is a constraint. Hmm, this does indeed seem harder. Regardless, let's charge forward with our questions. Let's start by determining how we sum over all possible outcomes. Well, it seems all possible outcomes should be all vectors of length three with non-negative integers which sum to 10. Okay, so it's decided. We'll sum over this set. But what about our sufficient statistics? Well, it turns out a reasonable choice will be to return the first two elements of x. Here is the reasoning for that. First, we need to determine the length of t of x, which is the same as the number of parameters. Well, one reasonable suggestion is to say that there is one parameter per column, but the sum to 10 constraint will subtract one. So t of x should have length two. And given it has length two, what should it measure? Well, all I can think of is to return the first two elements of x. That's okay. The last element will be known implicitly by the sum to 10 constraint. So this is our sufficient statistic. Moving on now to the trickiest of parts, h of x. Well, it turns out that this is a reasonable choice. Again, let me walk you through the thing here, which as you could tell, there's a lot of. First, we need to take a different perspective on x. Let's imagine x is counting over 10 events, where each event takes the value of either a, b, or c with some probabilities dictated by our parameters. For example, one sequence might look like this. Then we say our x vector is counting each category from this sequence. Here we get a count of 442. Now, from this perspective, some x's seem more likely than others, regardless of the parameters. This is because the counts differ in the number of sequences that produce them. For example, if you consider x equal to 10, 0, 0, then you realize there's only one sequence that can produce it, the one with all a's. But if you consider x equal to 9, 1, 0, you realize there are 10 sequences. So it seems in the latter case, x is more likely. Therefore, making h of x count the number of sequences that could produce x is a reasonable choice. And that turns out to be this function. Whew, okay. So we've made all our choices. Now let's just fall through and see what we get. If we plug things in, we get this expression where the normalizer is given by this. Notice it's summing over all possible x's. Now, if this form looks unusual, that makes sense. It is indeed unusual looking, but let me reassure you, it turns out you can rewrite it into this form, which is the multinomial distribution. Here, each peak is the probability of A, B, or C within the sequences we showed. As you can imagine, they are determined by theta. So we see reasonable choices lead us to another familiar distribution. At this point, I could continue on with another example, but I think a better approach is to show you the breadth of the exponential family. Here's a partial list of the choices you could make and the distributions you'd get. For example, if you integrate over the positive part of the real line and you make h of x equal to one over x and the sufficient statistics are log x and the square of log x, then you'd get the log normal. Okay, let's look at a more exotic one. Let's say x is a length d vector where each element is a real number and it's over this space which we'll integrate. Also, let's say h of x is one. And finally, the sufficient statistics are the x vector itself, along with the outer product of x with itself, stretched out into a long vector. Then this thing would be the multivariate normal. That's pretty flexible. I'd say something like the Bernoulli and the multivariate normal are worlds apart, but not according to the exponential family. And this list isn't even complete. There are a bunch of other distributions you can reach from this perspective. But at this point, I should point out what you can't reach from here. 
First, the uniform distribution is not within this family. That's because its domain depends on the parameters. That is a no-go for this family. The possible x values need to be a fixed set. Second, the student t distribution isn't in here either. This is because the term that would appear in the exponent can't be factored into our nice and neat dot product. And at this point, we're done. Sort of. Hopefully I've convinced you that the exponential family covers a lot of distributions, but that alone isn't terribly useful. What is useful is all the special properties that follow from this generalized structure. If you're interested in that, then check out part two. And finally, thank you for your focus. If you enjoyed this video and would like to continue learning about statistics and machine learning, please like and subscribe. Content like this is the content I'll continue to make, especially if I can get your support.